Howdy, Five Guy listeners. Welcome back to the Five Guys podcast. Today, it is Five Friday Feedback with a little viewer mailbag at the end of the episode, so make sure to stick around with that. Today, we are going over Monday's podcast with our guest, John Grace. It was a graceful conversation. I've been waiting all week to say that. <laughs> Can't deny that. But um, yes, with that being said, howdy, Chris. Welcome in. How was your week? How, how have you been? Yeah, week was great. I'm glad to be back here with you. Um, you know, Monday's pod was great having our guest John here, but unfortunately you weren't there. So it was just me and John. So I'm glad to have the old dynamic duo back together. <laughs> so now we can kind of debrief everything that John and I talked about and hopefully be able to kind of recap a little bit and maybe add some philosophy, some psychology, yep. some Star yep. Wars. And we'll talk all <laughs> about everything there based on what, what he and I talked about. So I know you heard the conversation recently. Mm -hmm. You obviously weren't there, but you did listen to the podcast. So what do you think about the conversation? Any insights, anything that you want to start out first kind of for our recap? First off, I just want to, before we do the recap, you said something about like, we're going to do talk about Star Wars. And as you were saying that, I was thinking about like, man, Chris is like Qui-Gon Jinn. I'm like, wait a minute. Does that make me Obi-Wan? Am I fit to be Obi-Wan? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, you said that. I was like, dude, he's reading my mind. He, he really does have the power of the force. It's kind of crazy. So I'm going to die at the end of this episode <laughs> by getting cut. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so so you are, well, it's a little, so then you are Obi-Wan, and then what does that make me, Anakin? I don't know. That's, I feel like I'm, I don't deserve the role of Anakin. Anyway, uh, I'll be, I'll be C-3PO. Anyway, enough of Star Wars, you know, we talk about Star Wars every chat, every chat. We'll probably talk about food too, because you know me. Anyway, I liked it. I liked, I love when we bring on guests. Great time. It's such a, it's, it's different. It's something different. I love it. I'm sad that I wasn't there, but, but I'm glad it happened. This was a great chat. Um, you guys talked a little bit about real estate too, which I love. I know next week's pod is going to be about real estate as well, which I'm, I'm stoked for. Got to write the notes for. Shan't deny that. Won't lie about that. Got to write the notes. But next week's pod's going to be great as well. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. I know he talked a little bit about you know, millennials and when they should buy homes. I guess, I guess we're not buying as many homes as we should be. Um, and we're also not having as many kids as we should be, too. So I don't know if there's any correlation there. But um, yeah, I, what, what was some of your favorite takeaways? Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I liked, he actually wrote an article. It's that the average American and artificial intelligence gets an F on their financial literacy rather than an A. Um, and that was actually a Vanguard study that we ended up pulling, that he pulled. And we talked about it a lot where the average person thinks that they're above average, right? And obviously not everyone could be above average. And you ask the average car driver, like average person who drives, hey, how do you feel a driving scale? Are you five average? Are you a 10 above average or a zero or a one, not average? And everyone says, oh, I think I'm like an eight or, or a seven. <laughs> yeah. But if everyone's yeah. saying that, then that means that no one can be in the average level. Unfortunately, when you do that financial literacy test, which I believe was like 32 questions about stocks, bonds, you know, money management, the average person, including artificial intelligence, got like a 32%. Ooh. And it's kind of sad because AI, like ChatGPT, it's been able to pass the bar, it's been able to pass the MCATs, it's been able to pass quite a few different tests, but it's still failing in financial literacy. And I think the reason for that is the way these large language models work is they end up crawling the internet and they try to find as much information as they can to make a statistical model as to what the next word in the chain is going to be. But unfortunately with finances, there's so much fake information out there that even the AI doesn't know what's real. So it's got to be almost impossible for the average person who's listening into the podcast and trying to figure out, should I open a Roth or traditional? Do I want to do my 401k or my IRA? How are you going to find the right information when even the chatbots are confused to hell? Because there's so much information and so much of it is misleading because everyone's trying to sell a product that it's really hard to find good sound advice. And I think that's where John and I really, um, we mesh and that's the reason I brought him on the podcast is I try never to bring on someone to the podcast who's just trying to sell something. Yeah. If you're trying to like sell our, our audience something, I, I don't really want you. But if you're willing to come on and be like, hey, the fi most financial advisors suck and here's the reason why, <laughs> yeah. then I want you on my podcast because I can say it till I'm blue in the face, but having another person come in here and be able to share their experiences, I think is gonna really speak volumes. Um, so yeah, I like to really talk with them about all that kind of stuff. And we really went into, I think like six different subjects. We, we really moved the game and I just kind of let him go with where he wants to go and I'm just there to facilitate. So what you're telling me is my ChatGPT financial advisor is terrible. Zero critical thinking. I'm not, I'm not saying they're not wrong, yeah. but I'm saying that there's nuance to the conversation that they might not know. 
or they might be wrong. Yeah. It's, and if you don't know the information, you're reading it, you're like, oh, this is truth, but it doesn't know what the truth is. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm worried about is like it'll present information that sounds good but is not accurate. That's yeah. tough to pick up on because you kind of you have to know, but you're not going to know if you're asking a question. So, and we use it for the show notes every so often. Sometimes I'll ask it for more data and it'll give me data that I'm like, I know this is wrong. <laughs> You're like, a liar. And then even I question myself. I'm like, am I wrong? <laughs> is it wrong? And then I have to go back and look at like actual, I have to like pull out a book and be yeah. like, no, 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 the, the chat box wrong. Yeah. But if it gets me, who's a professional at this questioning my own knowledge, if you don't know, if you're asking the question, you don't know the real legitimate answer. It's going to be really, really difficult. And that's yeah. why I think financial literacy gets even worse. And that's why the average American is getting an F. Yeah. Honestly, it's kind of funny. I know we equate a lot of what we talk about on the podcast to, you know, finance or whatever. I'm going to take a little bit of a U-turn and go into food. It's so important to check your sources, right? You shouldn't be taking advice from something or someone that you don't aspire to be. Now, granted, if you're taking advice from a fan financial advisor, you're going to want them to be a fiduciary. Simple as that. Make sure they have your best interest in mind. ChatGPT doesn't know you. It doesn't, it just doesn't. It doesn't know the personal aspect of it. It doesn't know the emotional. You can only tell it what you can tell it. But I know Chris, Chris has a background in, you know, psychology. He, he knows the mind. I'm telling you, he's Qui-Gon Jinn. He's wise. This is the most wise, one of the most wise people I know. There's so much value in hiring people like Chris and having them around. Unbelievable what they can do for your life. I mean. It's not, dude, I, it's crazy. Cause like we'll have conversations and Chris will be talking and it'll be about money, obviously, but it relates to the psychology of like human habit. It's like, I built you the financial plan. Why didn't you use it? And I need another one. It's like, well, you're not going to use the second one. So why should I build you another one? You're not going to use the first one. It's like, well, X, Y, Z happens. Like, no, no, no. You got to get to the root of things. And I love that aspect of you, Chris. I think that's why um, this podcast is so valuable because we're oftentimes bringing tough conversations, tough topics, and making them simple, making them applicable to real life. And I love that. Also, with that being said, don't use ChatGPT for recipes. They, they don't work. <laughs> they, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I'm going to be honest, dude, I made Krispy Kreme donuts before. I was like, I searched it up. I was like, I need sour cream, old fashioned donut. You know, I love this, the old fashions, right? Mm -hmm. First batch, slapped. It was really good. I'm like, ah, I've hit a gold mine. I was like, you know what? Give me Krispy Kreme donuts. Krispy Kreme donuts? Like the original glaze? I'm like, give me the recipe for that. Sucked. Total trash. Not good at all. So I'm like, sometimes it wins, sometimes it losses. Sometimes it lo yeah. loses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, well, you, you were going to say something, Chris? No, I think, I think that's that's so right. Um, it's it's weird with, with the AI bots because at the end of the day, they can tell us their truth like their truth is based off of what we have said, mm -hmm. but they can never actually taste the food to know if it's good. They can never experience these things. Um, you know, uh, have you ever have you heard about like these AI girlfriends and stuff like that? That's kind of coming out and becoming like a, a new, a new. You're talking about my current, my, my AI wife. Yeah. yeah. What about her? My AI wife. You, you got a problem with that? Huh? Um, <laughs> yeah. Tell me about her. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, guess, I guess people are like kind of falling in love with, with AI chatbots because they're able to begin to, learn all of these nuances of people and like they're they're telling them all about their days or the humans are telling yeah. these AI girlfriends about their days and their lives and the, the things that they like and don't like and the AI software is always there to be supportive and always be there for them and they're starting to fall in love with these AI chatbots but that's not real life because real life is mess messy it's really tough and creating a life with somebody and moving forward with somebody is is hard and you know, going through those struggles is a thing that actually gets you to grow. I think that's why so many people end up going into affairs is because they look at this other person and they, they put all of positive attributes. They talk about like, oh, maybe we have such good lust for one another and we have good mm -hmm. communication. We have all these things, but they're only experiencing the highs. And then the moment that they have their first fight, they experience the lows and they realize, like, oh, this is just another person. This is an actual person that I need to grow with. And I can't be my own idiosyncrasies all the time. I need to grow a little bit in order to develop a life with this person. And then they fail. So I get concerned when people are falling in love with chatbots or only interacting with AI because that's not real life. And no. if you only interact that way and then you go into real life and you come up against your first challenge, 
you know, it's kind of like kids, right? If you just shelter them their whole life and you like tell them, oh, the world's always going to be there for you. Mommy, daddy's got you. We're never going to let anything happen to you. And you like maybe keep your daughter locked up so they never get into trouble. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, the moment they turn 18 and they go out into the real world, it's going to be like a real smack in the face and it's going to be really tough for them. So sometimes loving somebody is having the hard conversation that you need to. And the same thing with like financial advice. Sometimes because I care about you and I love you as a client, I need to tell you the hard thing that you don't want to hear. And you're paying me to basically be an asshole to you. And like say like, no, what you're thinking is wrong. Yeah. What a concept. <laughs> what a concept. What a concept. Um, so getting back to like trying to be more financially literate, seeking great advice. I know when you said you were, you might've been coming up with the show notes for maybe, you know, a podcast or whatever. And ChatGPT gives you the wrong information. You revert back to a book for the hard data, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, small questions, maybe ChatGPT can be great at. I wouldn't base lifelong decisions on it. Probably best to seek a professional. But if you had to pick a few books to kind of grow that knowledge base and really um, protect yourself from those financial mistakes that, I mean, let's be honest, like, it's not just ChatGPT steering you wrong. It might be your father, your mother, your friend, your boss, you know. It could even be a financial advisor that's not a fiduciary it, that could be steering you wrong. It very well and likely is. Yeah, which is crazy. It's like like if I went to the doctor's office and I'm like, Doc, I my my whole chest is purple, and he's just like, you know, have you been painting recently? It's like, dude, I'm dying over here. He's like, no, this is this is serious. It's crazy. It's actually crazy. So obviously, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Look for a fiduciary, fiduciary, someone who has your best interest in mind when choosing a financial person. But as far as building a concrete structure in your mind when it comes to finance, what are some books we can like reference or just like learn on? I'm going to give you two books and they're both written by the same author. And I recently okay. reread them and I really like them. They're by Morgan Housel. Okay. And Morgan Housel focuses a lot on the behavioral aspects of things. And so do I. So I love them. So the first book is called The, the Psychology of Money. Big recommendation. Yep. The other book is his new book and it's called Same, Same as Ever. So I'd recommend those two books. And because like I, what we talk about on the podcast, so many people, they're looking for the quick fix. Tell me the, the secret sauce to becoming financially independent. And the secret sauce, the investing side of it, that's maybe 20 to 10% of being good with money. Mm -hmm. The other 80 to 90% is your habits, your discipline making more money, spending less money. That's what gets you good with money. But so many people, they focus on this small, but very in tantalizing and sexy stocks and the bonds, you know, and, and when, you know, the pennies or whatever they'll, or the cryptos or what all that is, the 20 or 10%, but they're negating the 80 to 90% of what's actually going to get them good with money. Yeah. I'm not saying that investing and buying assets is not important. It's extremely important. It's 10 to 20%, but it's not as important as your habits, your beliefs, the hard work that you have to put in every single day. There is no quick get rich quick, quick schemes because for every one person that a get rich quick scheme works for, there are 99 other people that lost everything. Wow. It sucks losing everything. I don't know if it's happened to you <laughs> I've, before. I've never done it. So <laughs> Dude, I'm going to try not to. Don't. Pro tip, don't. Speak from the experts, don't. Now, I haven't lost everything, but I have lost stuff before. Not a great feeling. Not ideal, yeah, not the, fun. Yeah, the goal isn't to win, right? It's to stay in the game long enough to win. And if you just go up there every single time, you're trying to swing for the fences, hit those at-bats, but every time you're putting everything up against it, it's going to be pretty tough. You're going to get washed out. You're going to get wiped out. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. And how so, many times is that often? I mean, there is a, like even we talked about it before, and maybe I've been thinking about doing a podcast all on him, but... Warren Buffett's third partner in, in the, the trilogy of, the, of who they were, which was Warren, uh, Charlie, and then Rick G. I can't remember his last name. I forgot it again, but it's Rick G. Yeah. Um, Google it for yourself. Um, yeah. But, you know, he was just as good as an investor as Warren and Charlie. And he went ahead and got doing, started doing leverage. And eventually it wiped him out. Yeah. And that's kind of the way it goes. Yeah. I mean, like we say in the stock market, you know, bulls make money. Bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. And it's a classic case of greed. You know, you're, yeah. he got greedy. Everybody knows Rick that. Urin. Rick Urin. Rick Urin. That's his name. Urin. Big, Urin. Big shout out. 
Big shout out. Yeah, so he 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 got a little bit greedy, right? He wasn't trying. Yeah, he was trying. What 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 do you think went wrong? Like he was trying to win the game rather than stay in the race. So Warren actually talks about it. He said that he and Charlie, Warren and Charlie, both knew that they were eventually going to get rich. Mm-hmm. But Rick wanted to get rich right now. And when you want to get rich right now and you're not looking for the long term, you start trying to make quick hits, things yeah. that are going to get me rich right now. Whenever you when you're taking out that that risk of getting rich right now, what do we do? We also take on a lot more risk. When we take a lot more risk, we, we may have more reward. We also have the chance to lose everything. And that's the thing that's made Warren one of the wealthiest man in the world is that he has time on his side. Yeah. Yeah. The case study and fall of Rick Guerin. Hopefully we're saying his name right. Kind of. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe if he didn't uh, get wiped out, we would know his name. Yeah, it'd be a household name. It'd be a household name. Um, yeah. And that's the crazy thing about it is like, obviously everybody, you know, Warren Buffett, the Oracle from Omaha, one of the greatest, if not the greatest investor of all time. Same thing for Charlie Munger. He could have been one of the greatest. Oh, he got out. greedy. He got greedy. Yeah. What is that old one? It's a pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. You already said it earlier, but that yeah. that's really what happened to him. So moving on from that, I, mm-hmm. the other thing I wanted to talk about that I thought like was the biggest insight that John uh, John Grace gave us was he was talking about the housing market. Yeah. And um, the thing that I like about every every financial advisor, they might come with different strategies, different ways of looking at the market, different things like that. The reason that I like John's approach is that he's actually pulling true census data. And then he is trying to predict the future based off of actual numbers and actual census data. Yeah. So he kind of said that, you know, when does the average person purchase their first home? And he said it was like 31 years old. And right now, most millennials are trying to purchase their first home at 31 years old. Um, But the biggest thing that he talked about is also millennials are trying to get into the housing market right now. And so is every single group, but we're at all time highs, interest rates are all time highs. It's extremely tough. So when he pulls the census data, he says the average person, they sell their house at 67. The average age for most boomers right now who own homes is 64, 65. The average age that people die is 78. Oh, sorry. The average person sells their home at 74. The average, the average person sells their home at 76. Mm -hmm. The average person dies at 78. But the average boomer right now is 74, 75. If we're willing to be patient and wait, we could have the largest wealth transfer in eternity coming for us if we're willing to wait. And this isn't just like, a, oh, who knows if this is going to happen? This is true census data. Like This is true data that we know people move out of their home at 76 because now it's time to move into assisted care facility or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then the average person dies at 78. And we're looking at the average. We're not looking on the coasts. We're not looking in Hawaii or California or New York. You're looking at the average person thinking of like Homer Simpson, the average like middle American, they die at 78 on average. And then when you think about it, once they have that huge wealth transfer and all of these young people, all their kids are now inheriting these homes, these properties, all these assets that while it may be great, they're getting all that. They're also to pay for the property taxes and the headache. And there could be a, and there most likely will be a large amount of property coming onto the market because- you know, if I inherited my parents' home right now, we'd probably just end up selling it. Yeah. But if everyone inherited a bunch of homes right now and everyone tries to sell it, that's going to flood the market with more supply than there is demand, which is going to drive down prices. So Big time. what John said was, if if you are a millennial right now or whatever whatever generation you are, Dominic, I can't remember. Um, what, what generation I'm like one before, Gen Z. Okay. I'm the one that the boomers Gen- all talk about is failing and, you know, it's like, ah, you whippersnappers, that one. That's okay. They talked about my generation that way too. Mm. Um, but, you know, Gen Z and millennials are all trying to buy their house right now. And if they have the money to afford that, they can afford the monthly payment. Then, you know, you do, you go for it. Yeah. But how would you feel if you went and bought that house? And then in two years, that house is now worth 50% less. Mm-hmm. And if that's something you can't live with, then maybe it's okay to hold out and wait. Because when you rent a property, you're not building equity in the home. No, but you do have controlled cost, and that you know how much your rent's going to be every single month. And more importantly, if you force yourself to save that money, then maybe you can buy a house in the future at a steep, steep. Yeah. Point. Yeah. I honestly, it's the difference between buying that house you really like the, you know, the four bedroom, the three bath, beautiful backyard for X amount of dollars. Or waiting a couple of years and buying that dream house. 
but the, all, basically the same price, you know? Yep. Dude. But then again, I might be mistaken, right? How many 68 year olds, 78 year olds live in your dream house? You know, that palace you have that you might see on Pinterest. Probably maybe not, not many, you know? Yeah, I don't know, but I, I thought it was so interesting when he was talking about, it. he said the average American historically was buying their first house at like 20 or 22. And then they were purchasing their Mick Mansion, their like bigger house at 31, 30, 32. But millennials, we didn't get that chance to buy our starter home because we, we just didn't. But now we're all in our 30s and we're trying to buy our McMansion. We're trying to start our starter home God. as the big house. Yeah. So we're all staying with, with, with average trends that have happened historically over and over and over again. Just we missed the boat and not being able to purchase that starter home because starter homes weren't around when we needed them to be there. Yeah. Now the average starter home that like our parents and our grandparents purchased was a three-bedroom, 1,500-square-foot or two bedroom, 1500 square foot. Now the average starter home that someone's trying to buy is four bedroom, 3,200 square feet. So we're doubling the size and we're also hoping that it's still gonna be the same price. I'm not saying that things aren't fair. They're definitely not fair, Yeah, but we work with the way the world is, not with the way the world, the way we wanted the world to be. Yeah, and it's kind of funny how you're like, you know, the millennials are starting their big house, but it's their first house, you know? And my generation's like, Dude, we're not going to be able to afford a house. You guys get houses? What is this? Yeah. You know, so it's like, oh, damn, that sucks. So, but, but next week's pod is all about real estate. So stick around because there's definitely, just because a home is very, very expensive, right? You can't afford it. You might not have the two years of experience. You know, you might be a, a contractor. You might be someone whose credit score isn't the best. You might be someone who, you know, you might not qualify because the debt to income ratio is a little bit off. We're going to talk about all that next podcast. Very, very interesting podcast. One of the things that I love most, I don't know if I love most, but I'm deeply passionate about real estate. So we're going to be talking about that next week. So be tuned for that. Good. And Dominic's going to be leading that yes, one sir. for us. So yes, sir. I'm very excited to be the student. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit. I'm just going to rat a little bit more on it. Um, you know, like we talked about interest rates so high these days. Unbelievable. Um, we'll, we'll talk about a way to get like a 2%, 3%, 4% interest rate rather than a 7% interest rate. Don't worry. It's not sketchy. It's not illegal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't steer you wrong. Chris would, you're going to meet this guy in the back alley, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, give him your spleen and he's going to give you this interest rate. Have you heard of a loan shark, madam? No, Chris would, uh, put me in a, uh, uh I was going to say a guillotine. Is that a, is that a jujitsu thing or is that like, yeah, a guillotine, a, a, a guillotine is, guillotine. is a, is a okay. jujitsu move. Okay. I'm thinking of the one where they had, you know, like in France back in the day with the jiu-jitsu. Yeah, that, that, that is also called a guillotine. Okay, just want to make sure. He will either put me in the jiu-jitsu form or the capital punishment form if I give you bad information. So, you know, laugh on the line here, so I'll, I'll deliver good information, I promise. But uh, yeah, it's a crazy time to buy a house. Crazy time in America. Not necessarily a bad time. It's just a crazy time. It's just different. You know, we've, we're seeing very high interest rates, inflated home prices, rents are... Rents are rents. So, uh, but yeah, <laughs> rents are rents. Rents are rents, man. Well, uh, it's gonna be a great pod next week. Can't wait to can't wait to get more into it. I know you guys. I love a good pod leading up to another good pod. Such a great thing. Is there anything else you wanted to touch base on with the uh, John Grace pod? Yeah, I guess the other thing that we talked about was the importance for people to work with financial advisors. You know, I would say that if you're a millennial and you're or you're younger, you're like, I can, I, I'm, I'm fine with volatility. I'm just going to do my broad, broad market index and I don't need the money and I'm just going to let it hold. And I'm going to go through the dips and go through the ups. Then, you know, go with God. You do, you probably don't need a financial advisor if that's the case, unless you need like other help that you need like financial therapy, stuff like that. Other things that we could do for you. You definitely talked about with retirees, the normal 60, 40 portfolio. And I talk to my clients about this all the time. It doesn't hold anymore because historically you wanted to have you know, 40% stocks, 60% bonds because they had an inverse correlation. So as stocks went up, bonds went down. As bonds went up, stocks went down. But after, you know, 2008 and 2020, we turned on our infinite money printer. And now stocks and bonds are both have positive correlation, meaning that they're working together. Yeah. So as stocks are zigging, bonds are zigging. And as stocks are zagging, bonds are zagging. So we saw it during COVID that when the stock market plummeted 30%, the bond market also plummeted 30%. So that old style of, oh, it's okay, we're just going to ride through this out with the 60-40, you're going to be okay. It doesn't work anymore. So you need to have 
more things going into there. We're truly diversified portfolio. So we ended up talking about the, the Yale, the Yale endowment, um, like the kind of the family office endowment model where Yale only 3% of their entire endowment is in stocks, is in common stock. The rest of it's in private equity, real estate, and a bunch of other things. And I'm not saying to go into those things if you don't know what you're doing. Please like pay for the advice. If you do it for free, you get free results. And sometimes when you're talking about your retirement, that's really not something that you really want to just kind of go and we'll see what happens. I watched a podcast on it and go and do it. Like check everyone's work. Even check my work. Don't listen to the things that I say is truth either because these are my opinions and things that I know work for me and the people that I work with. But one thing that I work with my clients on is I never try to tell you what to do. I try to give you the positive and the negative, both decisions. But ultimately, you're the one with the infinite wisdom. You're the one that you know what you want to do. I just try to help you discover what you want to do and ask you if the question you're asking is really the right question to be asked. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. And I agree with what Chris was saying. Like, do your research. Don't jump into anything just because it's like, we're saying it's the hot new things. No, just do your research, guys. Go accordingly. Don't risk your retirement. Just don't. It's not no. smart. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. But yeah, I um, I like the pod. It was a great pod. And if you haven't checked it out already, go check out Monday's pod with John Grace. Great one indeed. But um, with that being said, oh, are we ready? To the- yeah, let's get on to five, right. uh, five Friday feet. All right, my... I, one of my favorite times of the week, I must not lie. I do like it. I look forward to it. You know, sometimes I talk in my sleep. I'm like, oh, if I read a feedback, your mailbag, is it time? <laughs> but now it is time so I can be happy again. So let's get right into it. This is the segment where we take a time out of our very busy schedule to read a email, preferably email, don't mail us, um, email, where give you feedback and it's kind of juicy sometimes we do love a juicy story sometimes we pick the juicier stories i'm not gonna lie if you want your story to be picked maybe spice it up a little bit i don't know i don't know um that's only half a joke but anyway with that being said my parents need to retire and i'm stuck financing it how about that what a doozy well howdy five guys my parents are age 69 and 66 They are reaching a point where they need to slow down and find a more affordable place to live on their social security income. Yeah, that's that's kind of, would you consider that a fixed income? Because I know sometimes it goes up. Oh, it's definitely fixed. Social security Security is a fixed income. Yes, you do have a a COLA, cost of living adjustment Mm -hmm. every year that goes with the rate inflation. But Mm -hmm. yeah, there's no way you're going to be getting like a, I want want more than that. (laughs) You can't negotiate it is what you're saying. You can't negotiate. We did a pot on that, you know, maybe, you know, find another social social security or nothing, <laughs> nothing like that. So anyway, um, that was a joke. There's only one social security. Don't get scammed. Together, we are receiving around $3,400 a month. My dad is currently working full time, earning approximately $1,400 a month. Uh, that's gross every two weeks. But he's considering reducing his hours or completely retiring all the other. Unfortunately, okay. unfortunately. They have almost no savings and are burdened with a significant amount of debt. Now, it doesn't say how much debt, but at the end of the story, we will you'll figure it out a little bit more. So they have a significant amount of debt, including credit cards, debt and medical expenses. Very expensive. We know about that with very low credit scores of 502 and 512. And you got to try. That's (laughs) I'm worried. You got to try. Don't worry. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. We'll get through this. We can do this. Currently, we are all living together in a rented home. Okay. Our current rent is $2,050. Okay. 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 While I have a stable job and could afford an independent life, I'm financially supporting them due to their situation. My sister also works, but has a more sporadic income due to health issues. Sorry to hear about that. Man, if you don't have health, you don't have anything. Facts. Like, that's, oh. that's really tough for your sister. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Oh, man, tough. I recently financed a car for them after their previous one was totaled. Okay. Oh. That sucks. Moving on. Moving on. Which adds another $250 to my monthly expenses. Honestly, $250, you're getting out easy. You're getting out easy. Yeah. I hate to I think see- the average car payment right now is like seven hundred dollars. It's so much money. Something, something stupid. It's so much yeah. money. It's so much money. 
It's so much money. It's over like it's over like eight thousand dollars a year. It's crazy. Two fifty. Listen, that's not bad. That's actually pretty good. It, they probably have like a, a Kia Soul or listen. <laughs> just like, I won't hate on a Kia Soul. That PT, Cru- that PT Cruiser life. I might hate on a PT Cruiser. I'm not gonna lie on that one. Um, yeah. Hopefully, the two fifty is, which I doubt, but I'm hoping that's including insurance. I doubt. I doubt. I doubt. I doubt. It. No, there's doubt, no way. Doubt, there's no I way. Doubt. I hate to say it. I doubt it. I doubt. No. I wish that would be great. Unless you got like the most like crazy. I don't know. I, I don't know. Even with, beat up. I don't know. Beat up piece POS that you ever seen in your life, dude. Dude, I don't know. I don't know. All right, I'm gonna stop railing these guys. So old my sister and I plan to move out after a year. Hey, good good information. I've been considering buying a manufactured home for them to rent from me. It's like a it's like a reverse like house hacking. I feel like I don't know something. I don't know. It's, it seems it seems seems interesting. As they tend to be more affordable, the manufacturing homes is what they're talking about. However, in our area, lot rents make them comparable to regular home costs. Okay. Okay. Oh, so where do they live? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's kind of crazy. Me personally, I'm picking a house. Although I will say, I will say, I've been in some really nice manufactured homes. I wouldn't. I would not choose it. Let me tell you, one of the coziest places I've ever been was the span of like five years where my dad and I would go over to the family friend's house and watch Sunday football. Let me tell you, it was cozy. So big shout out nice. to the bear. That was his name. Anyway, a lot of, a lot of behind the scenes, a lot of, a lot of lore here today on today's episode. So they've been considering buying a manufactured home for them to rent from the child to the parents. Okay. We know that there's $3,400 in social security that should be sufficient for them to afford a one bedroom in a senior community, but I'm worried about their credit score. That's a valid concern. Would cons- Yeah. Excuse me? What is this next sentence? Would consulting a bankruptcy lawyer be advised for them? Oh. I feel lost and unsure of where to start. I can't continue to shoulder their financial responsibilities, especially after the expenses incurred from our recent... Mo- Thanks for any advice you can provide. From helping my folks find a place with Social Security as their base. Well, that is a doozy. Uh, five twelve and five oh two. That's a bit of a concern. Understandably, a concern for the child here. What do we got, Chris? So when I hear this, first off, to our friend who wrote in, that's really tough being a, a kid of a parents that did not set themselves up. So I will speak to the kid and tell my advice to him. But first, before I do that, I want to talk to parents. Parents. If you have kids and you are not being financially responsible, you are not taking care of your own responsibility, your own retirement. Then that means by definition that your retirement plan is your kids. Mm -hmm. Your retirement plan is to burden your kids like this young man is with his parents in order to financially support them. And that is not fair. If you guys had an agreement that, hey, we're going to put you through college, we're going to do all this stuff for you, and we expect that you will take care of us in our older age, that's totally fine. not going to knock that. There are cultures where that's totally fine. Yep. But if you're just going to write it out, see what happens, and like we'll just, just leave it up to the Lord, that basically means you're going to burden your kid to support you. And now you've burdened your son and your daughter to be hamstrung to support you in your retirement. Mm-hmm. So to, th- to this, to our writer and to their parents, retirement is a financial status, not an age. Yeah, it's not a requirement. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, carry on. Honestly, I think your parents, they need to wake up. People don't just get to retire because they're finally tired of working. People get to retire when they have enough money prepared and they no longer need to work. Mm -hmm. You can't just hit a magic age, 60, whatever, 69 and 66 and just be like, all right, I'm done. I've reached my magic age. So with that being said, no, it's not a good idea for your dad to stop working. Can he cut back his hours if he's, if he's really struggling? Yes, of course. But if he still has credit card debt and medical expenses, and we have a fixed income of $3,400 for from the social security, that's at least guaranteed. We know we're going to keep on getting that, but I don't know how much medical debt and how much credit card debt you have. And more importantly, I don't know what your parents spending is a month. So I don't know if $3,400 is enough for them. On average, that should be enough for two people to find a one bedroom apartment or a one bedroom place. But if they're Fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, God knows what amount in debt. You have to pay for those debts too, and that's going to be taking out of that money. 
when it comes to buying the manufactured home and having your parents rent, quote unquote, rent from you, mm -hmm. we already know what's going to happen. They're not going to pay you. Yeah. And then you're going to have to pay for it yourself. And now we're going to have to add in all of this mess, family mess that's going to have to happen too, because now we're fighting with our parents. You've already had to buy them a car. Yep. You're, I, I'm not sure if they're paying for rent at all right now with you and your sister, or if you and your sister are paying for that tab and they're maybe just covering food and stuff. But these parents' failure to plan for their future is now holding back the, the, their son and their daughter who has medical issues and really should be focusing on herself and getting better. Because if you don't have health, you don't have anything. And I, don't, I have to imagine that this level of stress isn't good for her and getting better. That's so true. That's so true. Yeah, that's way better. I'm telling you, Chris, you got to understand, for this podcast to work, guys, Chris is the master. I am the learner, right? I'm the student. Right? He's the master. My plan was just put him in the manufacturing home and then just jack up the rent, honestly. Um, <laughs> you know, but Chris has a way better idea, way better than mine, you know. But uh, yeah, I think it's hard to make new habits, especially if you're older. 500 credit score. You have to try, you gotta to get try that for that. That's not, that's, 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 that's beyond bad financial literacy. That's like, like, we're competing at this point because it goes down to like 480 no or it's it, i don't even know the bottom uh, i think it's 350 i think it's 350, 350? 350 okay, okay. to 850 not, i think we're not at the bottom i've never yet. i've never tried to hit the bottom no so no know. no could be a fun challenge though how you know it's like the, it's, I, it's hold on it's kind of like those personal trainers who that get fat and then they 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 build back to get their six pack it's kind of like that you could be the first you one know, to do it. I, I, I have an 815 right now, and I'm going to try to keep that up there. Dude, um, I'm tell, we could speed run to the bottom, Chris. It could be entertaining. You know, my, I have an 815. They have, if I was to reverse that, it'd be a 518, which is close to theirs. That's so sad. <laughs> that bumps me out so much. You can, you can invert my numbers and have their numbers. That's so sad. Oh, Okay. We talk about this all the time. It, 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 it's it's so important to be financially literate, guys. If you want to buy a house, if you want to, if you want to retire, you know, this whole podcast is based around financial independence, right? Retiring early, we like that. You know, Chris said 68, 69, 69 and a half, whatever the magic number that the government sets is the quote unquote retirement age. That is not mandated. That's not. It's not law. Like it's not a requirement. Like that's a. That's a, yeah. a reward for being financially, you know, proper and, and educated, you know. But at the same time, retirement doesn't have to be at 68. It can be at 58 or 48 or 38 or 78 or 88. Some people like to work into their old age. Some people don't like to work. You know, it's all about how you plan your life. And you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And when you fail to plan and you have dependents, you're bringing them with. So I, yeah. I, I'm grateful that this person is watching the podcast. I'm grateful that they have a willingness to actually learn because you can't get to a 502 in two months. Probably not well, even to in, be fair. It's the, go for it. it's the parents. The, the yeah. parents aren't the ones writing in. It's the kid writing in. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm grateful so, for the, for the, did I say the parents? I did say the parents tonight. Yeah. It's kind, yeah. Of, kind of sounded that my way. Bad, my bad. My bad. I'm grateful for the, the son or daughter that wrote in, in this situation, trying to better themselves, trying to figure it out. Yeah. You know, like Chris gave his, his thoughts on it. You know, you know, I, I don't. And, and, I, and I have a few, <laughs> I have a few more actually. So when it comes to the credit score, I first would probably preface you to go back to episode 26 of the five guys. If your parents are willing to try to work on that, I break down everything that, that makes up your credit score and more importantly, how to improve your credit score. Because if we know the number, that's well and good. But we need to know what makes up that number. And then we need to know what we need to do to make that number better. Because your credit score ultimately is a grade that says how worthy are you of borrowing money. And if you have a shitty grade if for these parents an F, no one's going to want to give you money. And that could really be an issue for senior housing. So if I was you, I would start calling around your local senior housing and see if you can get on the wait list for them. Typically, my understanding here in Arizona, credit score does not matter given that they have social security and the income, but in your state, it very well could matter. That credit score could be a huge detriment to them getting into that, but with they're making $3,400 a month, that should very well cover a one room in a senior living facility. But if they have credit card debt, medical debt, and if their expenses are also 
all equaling $3,400 or $3,000 or $2,500, that's not giving you a lot of room to be able to purchase that, that one bedroom place. So I don't know how much your parents are currently paying in rent. If they're not paying anything, then that means majority of the money is going to go just to covering the house. And that doesn't leave any money for food, electricity, the bills. So your parents really can't stop working until they have those things under control. Mm -hmm. When it comes to bankruptcy, I do not have enough information. I don't know how much debt is significant amount of debt. Significant to you could be $5,000. Yeah. Significant to you could be $500,000. Yep. Those are two very different things. So when it comes to bankruptcy, it is a no joke situation. I would first go to episode 32 of the five guys. We talk all about bankruptcy, the different types and where you're thinking about going down that rabbit hole. But yeah, maybe depending on the situation, bankruptcy might be a good course of action especially if they don't have anything to their name currently, because mm -hmm. then there's nothing for them really to take. And I don't know how you purchase the car. If it's in your name, you're just letting them borrow it, but then they could declare bankruptcy. I don't know. Actually, I don't want to go into it too deeply because I don't want to start giving you weird things. But the most important thing is your, parent, your parents need to understand is that retirement is a financial status, not an age. Yeah. Just because you hit a magic number, it does not mean that you magically don't have to work anymore. You get to not work by being financially responsible enough to get to the point that you don't need to work anymore. You can retire at 30 years old, given that you were financially responsible enough to make enough money, have enough assets that are paying you enough income for you to be able to then lower your lifestyle down enough to live. If you're willing to have a lifestyle that is worth, I don't know, $10,000, then you could have a pretty great retirement like right now. But good luck living on $10,000 a month. It all depends on where you live too. You know, if you live out in Ohio, ten thousand dollars a year. Yeah, ten thousand dollars a year. You said a year, right? Yeah. 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 yeah I, said, I said a month, but I meant. Yeah, because I was like, hey, yeah, I just wanted. To, I'm glad you clarified that because I'm like, there's a lot of people who. I mean, everybody can live on ten k a month, but yeah, ten k a year. I think, I think I'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Chris. I don't know, man. It'd be tough. You know, the Ferrari payments and all that. Um, no, I. Man. See, guys, I don't know how tech savvy the parents are, but this is a prime example of why you can't use ChatGPT for all your financial advice. OK, we already talked about how ChatGPT gets an F score in finance, right? It's so important. Whatever stage you're at, you know, educate yourself with books. Make sure that it's a trusted source. Make sure it's a respectable source. Um, and if you're at that stage of your life where you start you know, you start making money. Maybe it's time to get a financial advisor. Make sure everything's dialed in for the future. You know, you want to be prepared. You don't want to have to burden your kids. It's not fun being a burden. It's not fun. No. Nobody wants to be a burden. So no, and I, I'm sure these parents, their thought was never, I can't wait to get to retirement. So it's going to be a burden on my kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Their thought was probably like, it'll work out. It, it'll be fine. Uh, uh, it'll be fine. I'm sure that was their thought. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. But eventually, you just keep on saying it'll be fine long enough. Eventually, you hit that day where it better be fine. And most of the time, if you just kept on saying it will be fine eventually, you're never going to actually get there. Yeah. Because you actually put in the work every single day to get you to the destination you want to go. Yep. You don't just hop inside your car and say, Google, take me somewhere. <laughs> you hop inside your car and say, Google, take me to this destination. You need to know which destination is. I've never just driven and just being like, I don't know what happens. We're just going to see where I end up. I don't know <laughs> what would happen in that situation. No, no, that's true. Well, I hope that, I hope that helped you guys. Best of luck. Genuinely best of luck. Um, yeah. Do you think seeking a financial advisor for them would be a good idea, Chris? I don't know what a financial advisor could really do at this point. <laughs> I guess it might be good to like, maybe look at some, just maybe to get some advice, like how much debt do we have? Like, they, they really need to know their numbers. Yeah. And I don't know if the son knows the numbers. That's why he didn't include them. But if the son doesn't know the numbers, the parents probably don't know the numbers. And if you don't know the numbers, there's really not a lot of help that anyone can do. Yeah. You can go to a financial advisor and be like, be my hero, fix it. But no financial advisor, some of the financial advisors will market themselves as the hero, but no financial advisor will be the hero to you. Yeah. You're the hero of your own story. Your financial advisor is your guide to getting you there. So maybe a financial advisor could guide you out of this mess that you find yourself in. But ultimately, they're the ones you have to put in the work every single day to get where they want to go. Yeah. And right now, you're really at the end of their rope. And that just kind of sucks. And you might have to keep on working until you drop. And I'm sorry to say that, but that's the situation that they're in due to choices they made in the past. Best of luck. Best of luck. 
With that being said, we're going to move on to our third and final segment of the podcast where we like to call it win of the week, where we kind of just try to end on a little higher note. Oftentimes the hero mailbag gets a little bit heavy, gets a little bit sad. Hopefully that's why we kind of inject a little bit of jokes, a little bit of playful banter into it. So it's not so somber, but we know that oftentimes, um, you know, they're coming to us for help, coming to Chris for help, but they're coming to the podcast for help. We try to end on a little more positive note. Um, with that being said, let's get right on to win of the week. Chris, would you like to go first on win of the week? Sure. Yeah. Um, I recently purchased a new Nighthawk modem um, for my house because my old modem, I realized I've had for the last like eight years. I didn't notice how old it was until it's just kind of dropping. Um, but I was actually able to get this modem for, for free pretty much using some gift cards that I received for a 90 minute timeshare presentation <laughs> that me and my wife went and sat on at our last trip to St. Thomas. So they were like, Hey, if you come to this presentation, we'll give you $300 in gift cards. And I was like, pretty damn good. So you're going to pay me 300 bucks for 90 minutes of my time. That's a hundred dollars every 30 minutes. And all I have to do is sit inside this room and I can leave it whenever I want. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. So I went and did it 300 bucks. And now I bought a new modem and the modem was traditionally $300, but I got it on Amazon for 180 with taxes. It was only $200. So I, I still have another hundred dollars in, uh, in gift cards so that I can go and buy something. Else Let's go dude. Nighthawk's good. That's solid. Yep. That's pretty damn solid. Yeah, that my, my router is a Nighthawk and then my modem was an Aris. So now I'm going to have a Nighthawk modem and router. So my hope is since they're a mesh network and they work together, mm -hmm. they'll be able to communicate better and I should have less um, internet issues. Maybe like, yeah, that's pork. awesome. I don't know why. I just got that, like the idea of you like waking up at like, you know, like midnight, like what the, what's all that noise? You walk into the laundry room, you're like the modem and the, the router just talking. It's like, ah, yeah, you wanted more chatter between them. You thought you wanted them to talk better. Well, now you got it. <laughs> Keeping you up at night. Yeah, I don't know. My mind goes in strange places sometimes, but well, that's awesome. It's all good. Dominic, what's your win of the week? So I've got a few win of the weeks. I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this on this week's win of the week. I might, I might not. I'll say the first one first. So I've been making more food recently, as you know. Now, last week we made a cake, five layer death by chocolate cake. I've never had a food coma quite like it. It was great. Made a pizza again, made my own dough. On the grill? You know it. The only way. The yes. only way. The only way. So much if you take anything from this podcast, take the finance stuff, but if you got a side plate, cook your pizzas on the grill. It's amazing. It's so good. It is, it is so freaking good. It's a uh, dude and it cooks a lot faster than you'd think. So watch it. Just, yeah, maybe we should make a, maybe we should make a, another five guy, like cooking with a five guy. Yeah, <laughs> you I'm make down. a budget friendly pizza. Exactly. Dude, I'm telling you, you can get cheap with the pizza, man. I'm telling you, I buy a little can of ragu. I know it's not the best, but like that'll last Ugh. me for like <laughs> four or five pizzas. Bro, you gotta, you gotta buy Rao. It's like, I can't, how you, well, you're basically eating freaking ketchup. I, <laughs> I season it. I have to season it up and like doctor it a lot, but. Yeah, I know. My, my wife would, would lose her mind if she saw rounds. <laughs> uh, this, this is why we don't make her pizzas. This is this is why. This is why. Um, we could honestly, you could make pizzas. Pizza is actually cheaper than you guys think. Like mm -hmm. the dough, cheap. Flour, water, salt. It's so cheap. A little sugar, cheap, right? Salt. You can even buy pre-made dough at like Sprouts. Yeah, that's where I buy mine. Yeah, yeah, you can buy, and it only costs like three bucks, three or four bucks. It's two bucks at Bashes, even better. I'm just there such a go. nerd. I'm like. I, for me, I'm just like, well, I bought a 40 pound sack of flour. I'm like, for the year, this this pizza. Yeah, dough, you have to knead it. it I, it's it's worth. I like it. I, I kind of. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie to you. I like it. I, I, I'm a sucker for it. I'm a sucker. Also, it, in my mind, like since I already have the ingredients, it's free to me. So I'm like, wow, I, I'm getting a free pizza. This is great. Rather than like, I have to like go out and buy something. I'm like, okay, dough, two dollars, two dollar pizza and a sauce, like five six bucks. I'm like, I made it for like eight cheese, pepperoni. I'm like, dude, this is getting this is adding up. I don't know. I'm a psycho like that. Anyway, um, yeah, we've been making a lot more food. Pizza came out great. Cake came out great. This week we made flour tortillas. Dude, I'm never buying tortillas ever again. So easy to make. Um, I was gonna make corn tortillas, but apparently I need like the secret like cornmeal for it. So I ended up buying some, and um, it's in my. It's I I'm not gonna lie to you. I haven't made it yet, but when I do make it, it's going to be okay, good. I was, I was gonna say, did, did it come out <laughs> yeah. good? Like... I'm going to make it probably tomorrow, uh, maybe over the weekend. But um, yeah, I'm excited. Hopefully it turns out as good as the corn, uh, the flour one. But honestly, it's just so much cheaper to make the flour one. So we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Also, I would like to also say that I was in a low point this week. I recently started a new job. Actually, the job was really good. I really like it. It's 
it's nice. The people around are really nice. My boss, you know, you kind of have an idea of what a boss is, like a real tool, like an Adam Henry, as my mom would say. And uh, one of the nicest people I've ever met. Really great people, really great environment. Good. Job went well. But I was just feeling a little bit down. Uh, and one of my win of the weeks, Chris came in and saved me. He's like my, like, this is why I say he's like Qui-Gon Jinn. He's, I'm Obi-Wan, he's Qui-Gon. And he just, he just came through with his infinite wisdom. And um, I think it's so important for everybody to have that, that person who's like five or 10 steps ahead of you. That's like, hey, I, I've literally been there. This is what you should do. This is how you need to like operate to like get out of this. And dude, it, it's just so much better. Um, I know we talk about a lot on this journey with our fee for the show. Like, you know, it's better to go, you know, with, with a team rather than going alone. But it's not just for finance, guys. It's, it's so important to have those like those mentor relationships, those relationships where they're a little bit ahead of you or they're on the same track or even you're at the same level. You, at least you can bounce ideas off of. Um, so I'm very, or even behind you sometimes, yeah. like having someone who's behind you. Cause you know, honestly, through teaching the podcast, teaching our listeners, even teaching you, mm -hmm. it cements this information in my mind and makes it better for me. I love that. I love that. So yeah, I'm Chris is part of my win of the week. You've been, uh, you've been subjected to win of the week. So, uh, I'm very appreciative of that. Cool. You're up on the high podium with the corn tortillas. So that's very high in my book. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Made it. Yeah. But yeah, guys, that is, that's going to be it for our win of the week. I uh, hope you guys have your own win of the week as well. Hopefully you guys can yeah. think of something. And if you do, leave them in the comments. Please. Tell us, tell us what your win of the week is. Like, honestly, I would love to hear it. You know, something to battle the hate comments, really. Um, <laughs> we get a lot get of hate comments. <laughs> your, your enthusiasm would be very much appreciated. But yeah, guys, don't worry. Those hate comments ain't going to stop us. They ain't going to put us down. And um, we'll only burn brighter and go further. So um, we appreciate all of you who came. And if you're still here listening to the podcast, I mean, this is your first time or second time, you haven't subscribed already, feel free to hit the subscribe button. Follow for more. We'd be posting Mondays and Fridays every week. I mean, every week. Not to mention... Chris is putting out loads and loads of videos over on YouTube. So big shout out to Chris on that aspect. Um, but yeah, guys, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are taking care of your finances, taking care of your mental, taking care of your stomach. Because I will say I'm getting a little bit hungry towards the end of this podcast. I'm going to go make some, make some food. But nonetheless, anything else you want to add, Chris? No, I would say we go get some dinner. Um, but more importantly, please for the show is tell a friend about the five guys podcast like dominic said earlier it's so much more fun to go on this journey together there's an old some sort of an african maybe it's a nigerian proverb but if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together yep. and this journey toward financial independence if you try to go fast you'll often burn out and you'll not end up making it but if you go together you will make it much longer and this is a journey of long because financial independence is not a destination it's a journey and it's something you're going to live for your entire life. Yep. So with that, please stick around for next Monday's podcast. Dominic will actually be leading the show. I'm so excited to sit back and not have to speak as much <laughs> and just let you go on. Dude. So we will see you on Monday. And until that, hope you have a great weekend. Later. This video podcast is sponsored by Mons on Wealth. The content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered financial advice. We do not endorse specific products or services. Past performance does not guarantee future results. The opinions expressed are those of the hosts and guests, not the podcast sponsor. It is crucial to consult with a qualified financial advisor or professional who can provide advice tailored to your specific needs before making any financial decisions, investments, or taking any other actions. If you are seeking specified help, you can reach out to Chris at monsonwealth.com.